Hi, my name is Marta. Hi, my name is Maciek. And my name is Piotr, and we would like to present our uh, idea and the results of the research, how you'd like to optimize um, network performance using uh, artificial intelligence methods. So, uh, first of all, our um, problem statement and the goal is, so the problem statement is that we, we identified uh, that under certain conditions, a traffic coming to a system can be unevenly balanced, even with all the features in working uh, to spread the traffic between the CPUs. So we would like to find an um, efficient way to, to spread the given um, IPv4 traffic evenly uh, amongst the CPUs in the system using a uh, receive side scaling. So first of all, we will go over briefly what's, uh, what's RSS, what are the problem, how it works, what are the problems with RSS, and uh, we would like to show you how we would like to optimize uh, key, uh, key generation for uh, RSS using um, AI. First of all, uh, RSS stands for uh, receive side scaling, and it's a technology used in modern uh, network cards that allows the received packets to be di redirected to and balanced to uh, between the queues and between the uh, CPUs in the system. So it enables efficient distribution of network packets uh, between the cores. And uh, it also reduces the delay uh with in the processing because the the traffic is spread amongst the cpus uh it can also optimize the, the software processing the packets since the uh all of the packets of a particular collect connection or a flow are redirected to the same cpu that will be processing the packets and usually the same cpu and uh, will process the packets in the user space as well. So we can have the locality of the packet from a given uh, flow. Also, what's uh, worth to mention is that RSS, while uh, spreading and balancing the packets between the CPUs, it, uh, it also uh, does not break by itself uh, in order processing. Uh, so the way the packets are processed, um, in the network card, uh, which is done in order uh, while the RSS uh, is spreading those packets among CPUs, it keeps the in order processing. So uh, we, we don't have reordering uh, introduced by uh, RSS. And also RSS is um, not meant to uh, um, to direct the packet to a specific CPU that the user would like to by default. It just, it, it's limited to just spread the packets and um, balance the load over the CPUs um, in the system. So the quick look how it works. Uh, so network card extracts some data from the, from the packet, some character, characteristic data from the packet that will that can uh, help to identify a flow. Uh, those are usually um, IP addresses uh, for IPv4 and some additional information depending on the protocol, like source and destination port. Um, and those are uh, given to the hashing function, which also takes a uh, initial uh, value as a hash key. And then as a result, we have a, uh, um, a hash value, which then the number of um, lower significant bits of the of the hash is taken, uh, and uh, lookup is being made in the indirection table to to specify the queue and eventually the CPU that will that will get the packet. So for um, 
TCP over um, IPv4, the input set itself uh, is um, contains uh, both destination and source IP addresses and uh, destination and source uh, ports, which totals uh, with 12 bytes uh, of the input set for IPv4. Uh, compared to IPv6, which is uh, for the same type of protocol, it's um, uh, 36 bytes uh, extracted from the incoming packet um, for RSS. So uh, Machi will go over in detail how the hashing function uh, works. Okay. So now, now that we've extracted the input set, we need to run it through some hashing function. The most popular one is stop leads hash. And as a first step, uh, we wanted to understand better how this hashing method works and uh, because that's crucial for key optimization. The principle of stop leads hash is that for every one bit in the input set, the hash value is XORed with the masked uh, part of the key that corresponds to that bit. So for the sake of presentation, let's assume we are lazy and we've only extracted four bits uh, for the input set. And we use the so-called standard key for the uh, hash function. As a first step, we need to uh, mask 30 to most significant bits of the key and check the bit in the input set. In this case, it's one, so we need to XOR the previous hashing result with the masked part of the key and save that value as a hashing result. And uh, as a second step, we need to shift the key left or the mask right and check the next input bit set. In this case, it's zero, so we don't do any action. And we just move the mask uh, to the next part of the key. And in this case, uh, the input set, we have value of one, which means we need to XOR the previous hashing result with the masked key. And uh, in the end, we get the hashing result. And as a last step, we need to, uh, we have moved the mask forward and, but the input set uh, value is zero, the bit is zero, which means we skip the XOR operation. And as a result, we get the hashing result, which then we need to run over the indirection table. Uh, the indirection table is, uh, in this case, is a simple four bit uh, indirection table. So we use the four least significant bits of the hash value to select the index in the indirection table. Since we, in this example, only assumed two queues and mapped the queues alternately, which is the default way of programming the table, we can see that our incoming packet will go to the queue number one. We can also see that many different hashes will actually go to the same queue. Uh, and yeah, this is actually the end of the RSS operation. And now the NIC will start processing the next packet. So the key takeaways from how the top leads hash works are, uh, First one is that we can immediately see that there is a connection between the parts of the input set and the parts of the key. This means that we can clearly distinct which part of the key will change the hash value for source IP address. Those are bytes zero to eight. For destination IP address, those are bytes four to 12. And so on for source port and the destination port. And also we can clearly see that some parts of the key uh, are used for more than one part of the input set. For example, bytes four to eight are used for both source IP and the destination IP addresses. And the other problem of the top leads hash is that in fact, we are not using the whole key. We only are using a part of the key for our hash calculation. 
and the size of the key uh, depends on the length of the input set. For example, for IP over uh, TCP over IPv4, we use 16 bytes of the key, and for TCP over IPv6, we only use 40 bytes of the input key, which is usually around 54 or 56 bytes long. And since Toplitz hash is uh, based on the XOR operation and the fact that more than one hash value is associated with the same key, it's not easy to find and predict where will our packet land after the key change. And that makes predicting this very hard. Now go back to Piotr. Uh, yeah, so um, so RSS has um, has some problems. So as uh, uh, if the incoming traffic has uh, little entropy in the input set itself, uh, we can we can have poor balancing between uh, between the, the CPUs, for example, with a NAT, <clears throat> where we can have a a node in the network that is receiving the packets. And it's behind the NAT, then most of the most of the pack or all of the packets directed to the to this system are have the same um, destination IP. So the active input set that takes part in the in the hash calculation that will differentiate the hash value from different flows is is even uh, less than the input set itself. And then the other example can be a web server, which also receives traffic with the same destination IP and destination uh, port. So uh, again, we can have, uh, depending on the traffic pattern, we can have poor uh, uh, traffic balancing between the, the queues and the, the, and the CPUs. Um, and also, if we have um, a lot of zeros in the, like Maciej mentioned it briefly, if we have a lot of zeros in the significant part of the key, by the nature of the of the XOR operation, uh, zero doesn't effectively do anything with XOR operation. So the more zeros we have, the less uh, alternation we have in the in the uh, final hash value. And then, uh, due, due to the nature of the indirection table, and um, since more than one uh, indirection index can uh, can end up with the same QID uh, for a uh, for different flows, uh, the traffic can be bunched together, and many flows can be directed to the same queue. Uh, um, we can we can actually try to fix this by modifying the indirection table, but anyway, it needs a, a intervention uh, from the user to to fix that. Um, and then, uh, what's even more uh, more uh, complicated is that some traffic uh, can end up with the with different hash value, but since we only take a portion of the of the uh, hash to point to the entry in the indirection table, then it means that we can end up with uh, more flows or more connections that will have the same uh, lower significant bits of the, of the hash. So those will end up in the same queue and we won't be able to um, simply modify the indirection table to split those flows from, the, from this particular um, queue because we will move all of them at once and probably for such a situation we would like to sp how somehow split them to, uh, to to balance the traffic between uh, between the uh, different queues. Also RSS itself can have some issues with uh, tunneled and encapsulated, encapsulated traffic depending on the hardware uh capabilities and uh, the, 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 the not all hardware can look at the innermost header to identify the uh, input set in the innermost header uh, 
by itself. Uh, so we can try to improve uh, RSS and we have a couple, we have a few options. We can, uh, we can modify, like I mentioned, we can modify the indirection table itself. So we can split and balance the traffic a little bit. This will help if the traffic has the same uh, lower section bits of the, of the hash because like I said before, uh, we won't be able to split those uh, flows to um, on a per flow basis because we'll move all of them. And then we will break another processing for modified indirection uh, for modified indirection table values. And uh, the other option is to modify the key itself. Uh, this will have to, like I said, this will have to split the traffic which has the same uh, hash value itself. But uh, the problem is that this will uh, also result in a an all flow reassociation to different uh, CPUs probably. Uh, because we will change the hash values for probably all of the uh, flows, and also we can we can we will break the in order processing of incoming packets, um, and we can also modify the input set itself. But it's usually uh, well, it depends on the if the hardware is capable of doing that, and it's not easy to identify uh, the input set correctly to, to do the uh, fair balancing. So now Marta will go over the ways that we would like to use to optimize the, uh, the key modification for RSS. Um, so as Piotr and Mathieu mentioned before, packet flows may not be spread equally between CPU cores by the RSS under certain conditions. But at the same time, a different key used by tablets hash function can potentially fix this problem and it can be easily modified using one of the standard driver functionalities. It's necessary to keep in mind that each key change will mainly change the flow to core affinity and as a result might degrade the performance because the application must um, be rescheduled to a different CPU core. Ethernet in general deals with this, but with the performance penalty, it's obvious that we should avoid it doing this, this too often. So we've started our journey um, to find the best key with changing the key to a different random keys. The same method is currently used by the Linux driver and the random key value is injected with every boot. It shouldn't be surprising that the results were also mostly random. So in the next step, we've analyzed the results returned by the genetic algorithm, which is commonly used to generate high quality solutions to optimization and search problems by relying on biologically inspired operators such as mutation, crossover, and selection. And we've tried many combinations and options with surprisingly good results for pickup files containing limited number of handcrafted flows, which emulated NAT traffic and only differed in uh, source IP addresses. Unfortunately, this solution proved not to be scalable and when we tried to use it in bigger, like uh, real life pickup dumps, we got stuck and we were not able to find a key in a very long, like a week long friends. And at this point, we decided to try to focus on uh, key bits which are more significant than the others to narrow down the scope of calculations. And that's why we've started working on Markov decision process implementation. And I really don't want to dive deep into technical details of this um, implementation. Um, but at some point, we just get an impression that we are going too deep and maybe it's time to try something less complicated like neural networks. And that may sound a bit scary, but the final solution, which we believe may help, is described as Bayesian optimization algorithm with the usage of unpolicy prediction um, with approximation. So I really don't think we have enough time to go into artificial intelligence details. Um, we would love to discuss it. So if anyone has any comments or questions, you can simply reach us using, for example, my email address. 
that just for now, I will try to describe the idea behind this fancy name in a friendly way. So, uh, proposed solution at this stage uses pre-collected pickup file and RSS software emulator to evaluate collected data. And then this data will be used to train a neural network based model of an objective function. And using this, um, we'll be able to determine the best possible RSS hash key. At this stage, neural network will be trained manually by engineers. And it's important that one of the assumptions is that the solution works offline in user space, and it's not interrupting platform standard operating mode until a satisfying key was found, or established time passed, or process was interrupted. And then later, user may choose to inject new key to his system, uh, improving traffic balance, or, or just wait with it. But uh, in a destined solution, everything will be automated and will happen in cycles. So in each cycle, uh, we will like to evaluate each not previously evaluated uh, hash key using RSS software emulator, then we would like to check if any of those keys is good enough. If yes, then we are done. If no, um, we would like to use all the data to train neural network based model of an objective function using the idea of automated neural networks. And it's used to search for the best architecture for a given purpose in the data. And then we can use this model to um, find next keys which should be checked in our next cycle. It's also important to mention that um, to reduce the computation time model which uh, will be used for, initial, for each initial program will be pre-tained during uh, research process and this is a very popular approach. So, um, so I'd like to answer for a question, why artificial intelligence? And to answer for this question, we have to realize that this is a standard optimization problem of balancing the loads among the server's CPU cars. And it's described as follows on a slide, where N stands for number of cars, and LI stands for current load, and LA uh, represents the average car load. And now, when we know that this is standard optimization problem, we can just connect the dots to case complex optimization problems that cannot be tracked, but um, that cannot be solved. The traditional mathematical programming are commonly solved with artificial intelligence based solution approaches. And these approaches provide optimal solutions, avoiding consuming. Um, many computed, computational resources. But on the other hand, uh, they often find local minimums or maximums, but in many cases, it's still significant improvement. So currently, we are working on a model on this artificial intelligence site, so we don't have any hard data to show yet. But uh, I hope that soon we'll get back with some the results, maybe in a form of a paper or another presentation. Um, but when we're done with the model, in the next steps, we would like to uh, think about more key generated, um, generators, like maybe it will be worth to add some randomness and maybe to reuse already prepared genetic algorithm then we will work on automation measurements and support for IPv6 because currently we are dealing only with IPv4. And this is everything from my side. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for your time. We, we realize that this is a um, work in progress, but this is our lead in and uh, basically we'd like to stimulate a discussion. So if you have any feedback comments, please reach out and all feedback will be appreciated. Thank you.
Okay, turn on my video. So let's see uh, what the questions look like. Uh, not a whole lot. Um, so I made a couple of points. Uh, it's interesting that packet reordering seems to be coming up uh, time and time again. I think uh, <clears throat> there must be an obvious reason for this is trending on people's minds, but clearly uh, if we change the RSS key or RSS mappings continuously, yes, that would generate a lot of, of packet reordering. But I'm assuming in this case, we uh, would only do it intermittently. And hopefully there's some, some hold down periods. But I, I don't think it's reasonable to, to say we can never change the key because we want to avoid out of order packets completely. And I know that um, in some circumstances, what we've seen in the past was uh, a customer would basically run a test and if they saw even one out of order packet, it would be flagged in the test as, as a problem, uh, even if it wasn't, even if it, if it was an improvement in overall latency, uh, they test for this. So there's some assumptions, I think incorrect assumptions in the industry that IP is supposed to be somehow in order uh, and, and there's reasons, there's valid reasons why it isn't, not just because of the network. So uh, there was a question. Have you compared this approach with RSS++ paper presented in 2019? Yes, we have uh, actually analyzed RSS++ as well, uh, but this approach is not solving all the problems because in some of the um, examples that we mentioned in the talk, like the push-pop gateways for NAT networks and stuff like this, uh, are not really, uh, the change of the buckets that RSS++ uh, suggests is not enough there because uh, if you have the wrong key, you basically don't have, don't use the entropy correctly. And as a result, you, uh, no matter how you change the buckets, you will not get a better balance of the traffic. So uh, could, could you or someone else give a short description of what RSS++ is? Yeah, RSS++ uh, generally uh, tries to modify the redirection table and uh, try to check which flows in the redirection tables gets most of the hits and if there are some flows that can be rebalanced, uh, the RSS++ changes the affinity of the bucket to the core, to the uh, queue or core. And basically it solves it that, this way. I see. Uh, yet another spin on um, packet steering. Yep. Uh, so there was a question, uh, is a patent involved yet with this approach? Um, not sure that's a technical question. Maybe <laughs> if, um, maybe you can you describe a little bit about what, what the plan is or, or how you intend to move forward and, and what the reality is of this? Uh, move forward with this uh, idea? Yes. Yeah, we generally plan to train the uh, network and we are looking for some real life traffic that we can use for that. So if anyone can share some pickup files, it would be awesome. Uh, because we were mostly training on some, uh, trying to, to run our algorithm on some uh, completely artificial uh, pick up files that we generated to actually simulate the issues that we have seen in the real, like that users reported in the real life scenarios. So when this is running the inference, I assume it's, it's adaptive, but it's still based on the original learning or does it do continuous learning? We plan to do the continuous learning. It's not the ones of, we rather, the, the plan is to actually, when you see the imbalance, you can run the script and it will recapture the packets and relearn and re, and change the key accordingly. 
Okay, so, so my impression, and, and like I mentioned at the beginning, um, this is a great case of a, a parameterization that we know it's really hard in practice to, to find the right answer, and there may not be any one right answer. So we've seen um, even simpler case, simple cases like how many, how many cues should we use on a system? Uh, depending on, on the number of cues, if you use too many, uh, that creates problems. If you use too few, that creates problems. But we always have to take into account what the system is used for, what the load is used for. And I imagine this sort of, of concept where we have to parameterize based on, on real loading and real um, world heuristics probably scales to, to different areas. So I suspect that um, as this, op as this sort of uh, mentality goes forward, uh, we would continuously expand the, um, hopefully the data set, but it seems like at some point you need to take into account more than just the PCAP file. We'd also have to consider somehow to measure user, user experience and, and um, latency and uh, usability. So that's just a comment. Um, I think this is. Uh, I, I think we're on the on the precipice of a, a large um, work in this area. Hopefully. Okay. Do we have any other okay, questions? Uh, uh, Joel, go ahead. Hey, how's it going? So, re regarding the approaches, actually, I think it's uh, pretty good, and uh, we haven't done a similar like like we haven't used machine learning uh, for this approach, but we have been doing like some testing with the hash keys as well, because some of the things that, some of the challenges that I'm facing from time to time are around uh, the network security monitoring tools like IDS, IPS, um, and things like this. And um, it's very important to kind of keep the flows stitched properly and together and parallel that flow as much as possible so you can actually uh, do as much work as you can on a single sensor node um, rather than scaling uh, to multiple server architectures. Uh, sorry, multiple servers. And so one thing I was curious about is like, um, you did mention that you're handcrafting your packets or you're using uh, generated packets. Um, I, have, like, uh, um, I personally have been using, like, um, I'll just call it out like, you know, breaking point as a solution um, to generate, um, you know, data center traffic and try to figure out like, you know, whether or not um, the balancing on RSS is working properly. And, you know, if so, like, you know, um, I actually check the RSS queues to see if they're properly balanced or not. And sometimes it's not the case because it's all based off of like the hash flow. And so if you're getting more data from like, you know, one uh, particular um, uh, client versus another uh, client, they actually may be scaled to like different uh, queues. Um, how are you actually like determining whether or not the balancing is working appropriately and things like that? All right, so I, hi, uh, I'm Martin. I think I can answer for this question. So basically we are just, um, for now, the, the only metric is we are just checking for uh, like the approximate number of packets hitting one of the queues and counting the, um, Yeah, we basically wrote an RSS emulator that ran over the pickup file and then we try to find the average number of packets, like average than the number over the queues that we assigned. Which means we just checked the, uh, you know, how well, what was the average square, um, root mean square error between the queues. Oh, got it, got it. Okay, thanks. Try to minimize. Well, that, make, that makes sense. Um, be, because the, the number of flows generated by the client server pairs is going to greatly like you know impact what that indirection table kind of looks like, right? What do you mean by the, how indirection table looks like? Because you're going to be hashing off. Uh, I'm assuming you're hashing off of the four tuples, IP, yeah. um, source, destination, uh, port, all those things. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you have uh, more, oh, I see. So if you're having like more packets uh, come from a specific um, uh, from a particular client, 
I'm wondering if it'll stay balanced or if it'll actually shift over to like more towards like one queue than another. Um, how are you like kind of breaking that down? Like you, like you mentioned web server traffic as an example. Well, if you have one big connection and one client uh, running a lot of traffic, then you don't really have any entropy in this flow. So you can't really rebalance that. It's more for when you run the web server and you, for example, your system generated on the boot, the key that is not doing a good use of the entropy in the source IP addresses, for example. I then you so. can rerun this. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. We appreciate it. Great work. Yep. Thank you.